Hi, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. By now you all know me, but if not, my name is Mario. I put out videos primarily on clinical research, and in today's video, I'm going to talk all about the ACRP CCRA exam, or the Association of Clinical Research Professionals Certified Clinical Research Associate exam. So the reason I am talking about this now is I am prepping for the exam. And as I was looking through uh, YouTube and various other resources, I didn't really find a great place for uh, prepping for the exam. So hopefully I'll create a series here as I go through the regulations that can sort of be used to supplement any studying for the ACRP CCRA exam. In this video, I'll cover who should take the exam, what the content of the exam is, what the format of the exam is, and the pass rate, and uh, finally, the utility and why I have not taken this um, exam prior to now. All right, before I jump into all of that, as always, I need to remind you to take a moment to please smash that like button and subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. Uh, the channel is slowly working its way toward 2,000 sub subscribers, so thank you very much for your support. I really appreciate it. All right, so without further ado, let's talk about the ACRP CCRA exam. Question one. Who should take this exam? In my opinion, it's people that have worked in clinical research a few years. And if you're taking the CCRA exam, uh, the Certified Clinical Research Associate, I would say you should have at least one year of CRA direct experience under your belt. Uh, more will be helpful. Uh, but that is my uh, guideline. Per ACRP, it recommends having uh, at least 3,000 hours of clinical research experience. Uh, they also do review your CV to see if you're a candidate for the exam. And once they do review your CV, if you're a candidate, uh, they'll give you a time window of a few months in which you can take the exam. All right. Uh, so in terms of exam administration, it is administered both remotely and at Prometric centers. Uh, I have an old boss that took a clinical research exam remotely, and she said she had all sorts of internet issues during the exam and didn't recommend taking the exam remotely and going to a testing center. Uh, I will be taking the exam remotely mainly because I looked up my closest testing center and it's over an hour away, and I have pretty good internet generally, although she said the same. So I'm hoping not to encounter uh, those issues. I do know a lot of different softwares early on in the uh, pandemic era uh, had a lot of bugs and issues, so hopefully they've all been resolved now, um, and I'll report back after I take the exam if remote was the right way to go or if I should have really driven um, all the way to a testing center. Um, I don't have an answer to that at this juncture, but I can tell you from people I've taken, they recommend if you can get to a testing center fairly easily, the testing center is the better way to go. All right, so let's talk about exam format. Uh, the exam is 125 multiple choice questions. You're given three hours to answer them. Out of the 125, 100 are scored. 25 are being tested for future exams. Uh, you do not know which 25 those are, so you should take your um, exam and every question as though it were uh, potentially going toward your score. So uh, just know, though, your final result is based on 100 out of the 125 questions. The topics for the exam and the pass rate. So let me go over the pass rate first, since that's easier. Um, I looked at tables for the last several years, the pass rate has been under 40%. So more than 60% of people that take this exam fail. Uh, I think there's a presumption that you can take this exam without that much experience and then people take it and then fail. Also uh, without adequate studying. So uh, in a moment, I'm gonna go over the content of the exam. And I will say, despite the fact that I've been uh, CRA for about 15 years. Some of this content is not content that I use regularly, so I do need to go back and study these. So uh, if you think you're just going to waltz into the exam and pass it, uh, it's, it's very unlikely. There are going to be uh, things that will stump you, even if you've been a CRA for a long time. All right, so my study plan and why I'm taking the exam now. So my study plan is to go over um, all the regulations that are covered. So I'll, I have them printed here, so I'll go over uh, them one by one. First is the very basic, the Declaration of Helsinki. These are basic principles for clinical research. So uh, anyone working in clinical research will be familiar with the Declaration of Helsinki, um, also the Belmont Report. So those are things that are covered pretty routinely. So um, I don't expect to spend too much time on that. 
Uh, the next thing I'll be jumping into is clinical safety data management um, for uh, safety. Now, if you know my background, I've spent my entire career in oncology. Um, this is something that I have a lot of experience with in oncology. We deal with a lot of adverse events, a lot of serious adverse events. So all the definitions are very familiar to me. Um, depending on what you work on, if you work with some IVD or some other areas, you might not be as intimately familiar with this. Uh, with oncology, I feel pretty prepared and I've referenced this a lot. So I know what's in it and uh, pretty uh, confident here. Um, the next thing is basically the heart of the exam and the heart of clinical research as a clinical research associate. And that is good old um, E6 R2, good clinical uh, practice. This is the thickest portion. Um, it's, I think, about 70 pages. This is where most of the questions are probably going to come from. So I expect to spend a lot of time. But this is something I also reference regularly. So I'm pretty intimately familiar with the content. Uh, that said, I don't have it memorized, which is why I keep uh, referencing back to it. But there are probably some things that I should know uh, offhand and we'll spend some time memorizing, including uh, the whole last section of this is a table of what should be in the uh, TMF or trial master file at the sponsor level and what should be at the investigator site files at the site level. Uh, and a, a lot of questions are probably going to um, revolve around what should be where or which needs to be in both. So that's something to be familiar with. It also breaks down things like elements of a protocol, elements of an investigative brochure, who is ultimately responsible if a sponsor contracts out to a CRO, uh, what are the principal investigator responsibilities, what is monitoring, and all uh, such things. So this is really the core of, gonna, of what I would believe would be tested on a CRA exam, because this, this is what, uh, as a CRA, you should know pretty much in and out. All right, so that's that. Then the next one is uh, this, which is the consider uh, considerations for clinical studies. Uh, this is not that long of guidance, so read through should be pretty good. Um, the next portion, which is something I know very little about, it's been a many, many years since I took a stats course and I don't pay too much attention to the statistical analysis and protocol, but it's covered on the exam. So uh, this regulation is the statistical principles for clinical uh, trials. So I expect to uh, read up on that and uh, spend some time because it's not an area I know very much about. Uh, so that'll take some time. And then the final section is an area I do know a lot about, but it's been a while since I've worked in this field, which is the regulations around uh, pediatric uh, populations. So if you know my background, I was a coordinator at Dana-Farber for two years in pediatric oncology and a lead coordinator uh, at Stanford in pediatric oncology. So I, I do have familiarity with the pediatric populations, but it's been a long time since I was a coordinator. Um, so I did some brief skimming of the reg regulations. I'm familiar with them, but uh, I will refresh my knowledge. So that's my study plan. I'm gonna go through section by section. And I said, I hope to create a video playlist as I go through various sections of what I learned and the kind of questions that could potentially be asked. So if you're planning to take that exam, uh, hopefully this will be an additional supplemental resource. The uh, question banks and question resources from ACRP are uh, pretty, pricey and I didn't want to approach my employer after they're willing to pay for the exam, which is my impetus for taking the exam. I said I was going to mention uh, why I didn't take it until now. Uh, I didn't necessarily feel it was worth uh, worth paying for out of pocket. Uh, the exam, you need a, between the membership and the exam, that's uh, about, I think about 700-ish dollars. So uh, I, I wanted to know the direct utility of taking the exam. However, in this case, my employer is paying for the exam. My boss is very eager to get the entire team certified. Uh, so that is why I uh, didn't take the exam till now and why I'm taking it in my 15th year as a clinical research associate. One of the nice things is with a ton of experience, um, I am very familiar with a lot of the guidelines. So like I said, I wouldn't really recommend taking this exam until you have at least one or two years of CRA experience under your belt. All right, hopefully this video is helpful. Uh, if you haven't done so already, take a moment and smash that like button, and I will see you in the next video. Thank you.